Finally, we advocate a position of what we call revolutionary peacemaking as a way to communicate and negotiate with dissidents and radicals. And this process is impeded, unfortunately, by the dogmatic and politicized use of the terrorist label, such as glibly peddled by the power complex in groups across the political spectrum. Well, I'm going to skip over some of the history that you can, you probably all know, just the history of the beginnings of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but you can remember Bush's proclamation to the nation and the world at large, and I'm sure you do. If you're not with us, you're against us. And before the rubble of the World Trade Centers had been cleared, the U.S. took a qualitative leap towards becoming a police state whose enforcers had virtually unlimited powers matched by zero degrees of accountability. No one was spared. We can remember, of course, thousands of foreigners were rounded up, were jailed and deported without evidence of wrongdoing. Have we forgotten this? Thousands more abroad were corralled and herded into compounds such as Guantanamo Bay, where they languished and still languish, many of them, in legal limbo. Courtesy of Attorney General Alfredo Gonzalez, torture policies were drafted, approved, and implemented as the CIA captured hundreds of enemy combatants, a nifty new label which stripped captives of all rights and detained them in secret torture camps throughout Europe, where many were killed or disappeared altogether. International treaties like the Geneva Convention were flouted. Laws and agencies used to monitor suspected foreign spies and criminals, for instance, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, were redeployed for domestic policing. The government built massive surveillance systems to monitor the communications of every citizen as big business fully cooperated with Big Brother. Bush rejected even the most minimal review laws as obstacles to catching terrorists and ordered illegal warrantless wiretaps on thousands of U.S. citizen phone calls and email communications, far more than initially realized or admitted. Dem <coughs> demonstrators and activists of all kinds became targets of surveillance and persecution and dissent in many forms was criminalized under the new category, which we call, call domestic terrorism. The Patriot Act endowed the state powers such as clandestine searches of one's home or office and access to all records, including student, medical, and library research. While demanding open access to citizens, the government also cloaked itself in secrecy by withdrawing presidential papers and historical records from the public domain and restricting citizen use of the Freedom of Information Act. Although the turn of the century may often bring optimism, hope for a brighter tomorrow, the 21st century began is a time of war, is a time of terrorism, violence on a global scale, as social, economic, health, and environmental problems mount to ever high, higher levels of crisis. In response to aggressive capitalist globalization policies that are devastations of the earth, animal species, and humans on a global scale, intense forms of resistance are mounting against the great endorsers of corporate domination, such as the US and the UK, such as evident in the alter-globalization movement, and indeed in Islamic jihadism as well. In conditions that foster political dissent and warfare, there is a need for peacemaking with revolutionary groups in order to prevent violence and to establish a cooperative resolution for all disputing parties, if and when possible, and it's not always possible, but if and when it is possible. Many governments believe that mediating and negotiating with radicals who use tactics of violence and terrorism legitimates and emboldens them. But typically, repression of opposition groups exacerbates conflicts more sharply. Mediation is not about winning. Mediation is not about losing, but rather attempting to reduce conflicts especially when catastrophic terrorist attacks or nuclear weapons are involved, to reconcile differences, to promote fairness and peace as much as possible. 
you know, sometimes it's possible, sometimes it isn't. Remember, I was invited to Israel to do some mediation work with Israelis and Palestinians. A couple of weeks, that was all I was there. Nada, nothing. Couldn't get anywhere. But we haven't given up, and that's the key. Consider the lamentable fact of Cuba. I was in Cuba, Cuba. Um, did a TV, two-hour TV special in Havana, of course, without State Department. Uh, I mean, my man, I'm Canadian, but I'm, also, I'm a dual citizen. I'm Canadian, but I'm also a US citizen. So I'm not allowed to go to Cuba, Cuba, even on my Canadian passport, because I have a US passport. And, but consider, so it was interesting. I've been to Cuba a number of times, and it's, it's interesting that Cuba has not posed a threat to the United States since the Soviet Missile Crisis showdown in 19, what, 63? It's nonetheless for the past four decades been officially identified as a rogue nation. In this era of global capitalism and vast porous markets, trade and travel embargoes remain firmly in place. And only due to its ideological rigidity and primal fear of socialism does the U.S. maintain this irrational and archaic stand. Whereas the conflict could easily be resolved were the U.S. to abandon its own hostile policies and intractable outlooks could easily be resolved, relatively easily. Such decades of fear and rigidity have in recent years seen the emergence of Latin American attempts at regional integration as a defense against US imperialism led by Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez. It's really interesting with the working uh, in Venezuela with the Chavistas and their educational programs there. I mean, I was on a TV show with, with Chavez um, in the audience with, with Hugo Chavez, Alo Presidente's t TV show, where Chavez talked about a, a, a kind of, it was, it was almost religious. I mean, he talked about this, this sense of, of having a commonality among people in the United States. I think it was, he was drawing on Jose Marti. But this sense, he was talking about this, it was almost like um, the sense of spiritual commonality that could emerge. And it was interesting, because I was sitting next to the great poet of the revolution, Ernesto Cardenal, from Nicaragua. You know, he was there reading his poetry at a, at a worldwide poetry conference. And he jumped up when Chavez said that. And he said, when I was a monk, my teacher told me about this prophecy. He like pronounced Chavez a prophet. Chavez a prophet, you know, like, he said, I've heard about this. Now I've heard it from you, Mr. President. I think it's prophetic, you know, this sense of this bond he would feel with the people of, of the United States. But of course, when I met, got to meet Chavez in Miraflores Palace, he did say, there's a monster living in the White House, Peter, and you must do what you need to do, Mr. Danger, and you have to do what needs to be done to oppose this regime. Um, and, uh, but I've been very impressed with what I've seen so far in Venezuela. It's called Socialism for the 21st Century. I'm a socialist. And I believe that one of the ways we can bring about a culture of peace is to bring about socialism, a socialist alternative to capitalism. I don't think it can be done within the value form of labor under capitalism. And I say that as a humanist, I say that as a Marxist. I don't think it can be done. Certainly can't be done either with socialism in one country. But the United States, other trans, well, it's not just the United States, it's a transnational capitalist class that exists in Venezuela. We call them the Esqualidos. They exist everywhere. In Mexico, the transnational capitalist class don't want to see socialism succeed. Many of us in the United States, some of us at least would, in Canada would, but the transnational capitalist class all over the world doesn't want to see the success of socialism anywhere. It's too threatening. It's too dangerous. Can't let it succeed. Have to demonize it. Well, what's the policy? Just, just to finish, we can talk about this in the question and answer part. In general, what are the, what are the rules of U.S. foreign policy? 